When the Bolsheviks came to power in Russia in 1917, they immediately began to tear down monuments and statues of the recently deposed Romanov regime. New statues and memorials were raised in their place, celebrating various revolutionary heroes and the secular religion of socialism. Ever since that time, the construction and demolition of Russian statues has been a regular consequence of changing political fortunes. Quite recently, almost a century after the Bolshevik Revolution, a heated debate erupted in Russia over plans to build a new historical monument, reflecting even more distant history. This controversy revolved around the implications of dedicating a statue to the 16th century Russian ruler, Ivan IV, or, as most people know him, Ivan the Terrible. More than four centuries after his death, Ivan finally received his first public monument in Russia, in the provincial city of Yurol, some 225 miles from the capital. A second followed in Moscow. The fact that Ivan had to wait so long to be publicly celebrated in his own country speaks to his complicated legacy. It also reveals something about the political climate and the nostalgia some feel for the glory and power of Russia's past. Ivan the Terrible was making a resurgence in Vladimir Putin's Russia. To be perfectly honest, There's much about the notorious Ivan and his reign that we simply don't know. No written record survives from Ivan's court, nor can we look at any correspondence in his original hand. Moscow was a largely wooden city, and frequent fires likely destroyed any historical records that existed. As a result, we're forced to rely upon foreign sources and oral traditions. Sometimes it's difficult to disentangle reality from legend. And it's been possible for successive generations of Russians to co-opt elements of Ivan's remarkable and fearsome reign for their own purposes, including the men and women who chose to erect a monument to the formidable leader centuries after his death. In this regard, even his violence is open to interpretation. For instance, Ivan's frequent demonstration of unmitigated power over a subject could be taken as evidence of a tortured mind and soul ruling his people with impunity. Or it could be interpreted as a decisive leader using any means to unify and strengthen his country. What's irrefutable is that Ivan the Terrible's reign has become a cultural and historical symbol of Russian leadership, for better or worse. As we try to understand Ivan, and his role in shaping the Russian identity, my discussion will be guided by three main questions. First, was Ivan really terrible? Or was he more awe-inspiring than terrible? And if he really was terrible, how did such a ruler become a folk hero to the Russian people? Second, how did Ivan create a spectacle of autocracy that outlived him by centuries? And to what extent did he use cultural symbols, and ceremonies to establish such deference. Finally, to what extent did Ivan's exercise of sovereignty set the standard of what constituted a strong Russian ruler in the imperial, Soviet, and Putin periods? Russia's origins date back to Kievan Rus in the 9th century, but Mongol conquest in the 13th century disrupted the organization of the early Russian state. After Mongol armies sacked Kiev, a centralized, unified Russia didn't reemerge until the mid-15th century. It did so then under the leadership of Ivan IV's grandfather, who was known as Ivan the Great. Ivan the Great solidified Moscow's rule over the former individual principalities of Appanage, Russia. These sorts of mini-states ruled by individual princes flourished after the Mongol conquest. Ivan established his authority over these principalities and just as importantly, declared Russia's independence from the Mongols in 1480. He reclaimed Russia's sovereignty from the Mongols and affirmed his own sovereignty over other Russian princes. Ivan wisely used religion to reinforce the authority of his rule and of his country. After the Ottomans conquered Byzantium in 1453, Russia became the only sovereign Orthodox power of note. Ivan the Great's marriage to Sophia Palaiologos, the niece of the Byzantine emperor, 
in November 1472, reinforced the notion that the Orthodox Russian state was the rightful heir of the Byzantine Empire. And it allowed him to depict his family as heirs to a great imperial legacy. In the last years of his reign, Ivan called himself not just the Grand Prince of Russia, but also the Sovereign and Tsar, the latter essentially a Russianized version of Caesar. Upon Ivan III's death in 1505, his eldest surviving son ascended the throne as Vasily III. That same year, Vasily married a young woman named Solomonia. In spite of hopes for a successful union between the young couple, it proved unsuccessful in the only way that really mattered for a ruler. It failed to produce an heir. Vasily III was now determined to divorce his childless bride, even though the Orthodox Church forbade a man to divorce an innocent wife, and the inability to get pregnant was not a crime. So, Vasily accused Solomonia of witchcraft, and a church council granted the divorce. Poor Solomonia was vanquished to a convent, and Vasily was ready to find a new mate. To expedite matters, he convened a bride show. This medieval spectacle involved Russian boyars, who were the Russian version of nobility, literally parading their daughters before him as potential brides. Already in his 40s, Vasily selected the 15-year-old Elena Glinskaya. And in August 1530, Elena gave birth to a baby boy, whom the royal couple named Ivan, after his much celebrated paternal grandfather. The fact that Ivan was born to a second wife gave pause to some Russians who believed that Vasily's divorce and remarriage were illegitimate. So rumors swirled that the new heir was cursed. These superstitions were given more weight when a second son, Yuri, was born deaf and dumb. Common lore had it that a series of violent storms in Moscow hit in the period around Ivan's birth. Russian oral tradition also refers to the appearance of comets coinciding with Ivan and Yuri's births. These strange accounts of cosmic phenomenon passed down from generation to generation convey the immense, fearsome influence Ivan the Terrible had on his country. The ferocity and power of Ivan's later reign seems all the more remarkable, considering the turbulence of his youth. When he was only three, his father Vasily died. This left a toddler and his mother in charge of the country. Elena was a cruel ruler who made many enemies. She and her family, the Glinskys, quickly vanquished or imprisoned Vasily's brothers and several other rivals for the throne. In 1538, however, Elena died suddenly, and young Ivan was left an orphan. This was an especially scary time in Ivan's life. Many members of the royal court believed that Elena had been poisoned, and she most likely was. The young orphan prince was surrounded by power-hungry boyars vying for control. His grandmother, Anna Glinskaya, and two maternal uncles gained the upper hand at court but violent intrigue was a fact of Ivan's childhood. So perhaps it's not surprising that Ivan developed a tendency for paranoia and an appreciation for violence. Several accounts contend that from childhood, Ivan passed many hours hurling animals to their death from high towers around the palace in the Kremlin and torturing birds that had the misfortune to be caught by the boy prince. By the time he was 13, Ivan moved on to humans and ordered a cousin and rival, Andrei Shusky, to be killed and his body thrown to the dogs. Suspicions that Elena had been murdered demonstrated how lethal court intrigue and personal ambition could be. As he came of age, the prince and his advisors realized that Ivan needed to be fearsome if he was to maintain control and assert his position as monarch at the expense of any would-be contenders for power. But some of the more astute men, who served as Ivan's closest counselors, realized that fear alone was not enough. Instead, men like the Metropolitan Macarius, who was head of the Russian Orthodox Church from 1542 to 1563, were convinced that Ivan needed to arouse awe as well as fear. Ivan's coronation at the Cathedral of the Dormition 
built by his grandfather, was the ideal setting in which to publicly demonstrate this notion. Makarios now anointed Ivan and crowned him Grand Prince Ivan Vasilievich, the God-crowned Tsar of the whole of Russia. Although his grandfather before him had used the title of Tsar after proclaiming Russia's independence from the Mongols in 1480, Ivan IV was the first Russian ruler to use the title consistently and the first to use it from the moment of his coronation. The most iconic and powerful component of Ivan's coronation regalia was the crown itself, the cap of Monomakh. According to legend, it was originally a gift from a Byzantine emperor to his grandson Vladimir Monomakh, the Grand Prince of Kiev during the 12th century. But scholars contend that it was probably made instead in Crimea or in Central Asia and presented to a Muscovite prince in the 14th century. In either event, by the time Macarius placed it on Ivan IV's head, the crown was both Christian and Russian. The cap of Monomakh thus reflected the roots of the new Moscow Tsar, as well as his intended destiny. It was a symbol of Ivan's connection to the emperors of the past and the power he could wield in the future. It has become such an important cultural marker that supporters presented Vladimir Putin with an exact replica on his 50th birthday. Ivan IV learned early on how public ceremony reinforced the role of autocratic rule. Foreign visitors to his court often remarked on the astounding deference shown to him by princes, boyars, and servants alike. In each room of the Kremlin Palace, a throne was set up on a richly carpeted dais. He was set apart, no matter who else was in the room. This practice, like the coronation, was modeled on the Byzantine example. Most historians give Ivan's first wife, Tsaritsa Anastasia Romanovna Zaharina Yorova, whom he married in 1547, credit for tempering his worst instincts, including an inclination towards violence. Yet that credit must be shared with a handful of trusted advisors deemed the chosen council, who steered Ivan's early reign in a most mostly positive direction. This group revised and standardized the legal code for the entire realm, instituted church reforms, and created the first standing army composed of infantrymen called Streltsy. Military reform was a priority because of Ivan's territorial ambitions. When he took the throne, Russia was a landlocked power. In the north, the remnants of the Order of Livonian Knights blocked access to the Baltic. To the southwest, the vast Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth stemmed Russian ambitions. And the last vestiges of the Mongol Golden Horde created instability on Russia's southern and eastern borders. Ivan IV resolved to change the balance of power with a reformed army. Ivan turned his attention first to the Khanate of Kazan. Conquering it would demonstrate the reversal of fortunes between the Russians and the Mongols and allow the Russians to control more of the Volga River and move closer to the Caspian Sea. Ivan left Moscow in 1552 to begin this quest. His forces prevailed after intense fighting and a long siege. On the way home, Ivan received the joyous news that his wife had given birth to a son, Dmitri. Fortune seemed to be smiling on him. The return was clothed in triumph. One historian relates that after changing from military to royal garb, Ivan walked on foot through the main gate of the Kremlin to the acclamation of his subjects, not only as a military hero, but as a great Christian victor over the Muslim infidels. Ever since the fall of Constantinople in 1453, Russian elites believed their country had inherited the mantle of the former great Christian empire in the East. According to this view, two Romes had fallen to infidel invaders. Moscow was the third Rome, and there would be no fourth. In this invigorated Christian empire, Kazan was the first conquest, but it would not be the last. Four years later, Ivan's forces took the city of Astrakhan to the south, on the banks of the Volga River, and established Russia's foothold on the Caspian Sea. 
Ivan ordered the construction of an Orthodox cathedral, the church of the intercession on the moat, outside the Kremlin walls where his people had greeted him following his triumph over the Muslim Khanate of Kazan. Known today as St. Basil's Cathedral, referring to the saint whose remains are interred there, the structure was completed in 1561. It's the most iconic of all Russian buildings, with brightly colored onion domes and nine separate chapels. The cathedral blends Eastern exoticism, intended to recall the conquest of the Khanates with Byzantine and medieval Russian architecture. It's helped to create what we understand of Russian style and Russia itself. St. Basil's Cathedral became part of the Tsar's sense of personal majesty. Among the most momentous public ceremonies of the year was the Palm Sunday ritual at the cathedral. Each year, Ivan would reenact his triumphal return to Moscow in 1552, while also commemorating Christ's entry into Jerusalem by leading an enormous procession of clergy, nobles, merchants, and officials from the Kremlin into St. Basil's. Such rituals, symbols, monuments, and buildings were effective ways to link Ivan with secular accomplishments and also to his holy legacy and mission. Legend has it that Ivan, upon seeing the magnificence of the Finnish cathedral, was determined that it should be forever unrivaled. So he ordered the architects who designed the cathedral to be blinded so that they could never build such a masterpiece again. This story is no more than a myth. But it speaks to the formidable hold Ivan IV maintains on Russian cultural memory. In earlier eras, when rival princes fought for supremacy, the country had fallen into disarray and civil war. But Ivan IV's unquestioned authority and the acknowledged legitimacy of the Rurik dynasty mitigated that threat. Then, in 1553, Ivan fell gravely ill. With his survival in question, the Tsar demanded that the leading boyars at court swear allegiance to his infant son. But some, fearing a regency led by Anastasia's relatives, resisted. The most influential courtiers eventually took the oath, and Ivan recovered his health. But the Tsar remembered the boyar's reluctance. It fed his paranoia and his determination to make his authority absolute. After his recovery, Ivan made a pilgrimage to the distant monastery of St. Cyril of Bielozra. In spite of his inclination towards violence, he was a devout man who went on regular religious pilgrimages. And as was his custom, he brought his family along, including Anastasia and his young son. This led to a tragic accident. The gangway of the boat the family was traveling in overturned and Dmitri's nurse dropped the child into the river. Ivan's only son and heir to the throne perished. In 1554, Anastasia gave birth to another son, this one named Ivan. In all, she had six children in a decade's time, but only two of whom, Ivan and Fyodor, survived into adulthood. Anastasia herself would not live to see her boys grow up. In 1560, after a year-long illness, she passed away. It isn't clear if she came to a natural or a nefarious end, but her untimely death reinvigorated Ivan's suspicions and apparently his inner demons. Historians tend to break Ivan's reign into two parts. The first, ends with the death of Anastasia and includes some of the more positive elements of Ivan's rule, including a series of reforms and the conquests of Kazan and Astrakhan. The second half focuses on the Tsar's increasing psychological instability. In the words of the Russian historian Nikolai Karamzin, Anastasia's death was the end of the happy days for Ivan and for Russia, for he lost not only his wife, but his better nature. Three years later, the Metropolitan Macarius also died, and the year following, the priest Sylvester, who exerted a positive moral influence on the Tsar, retired to a monastery. From this point on, Ivan indulged his instincts, fears, and desires. Indeed, as, in, as affectionate as Ivan had been for Anastasia, her death did not stop him from marrying again. 
six more times. Yvonne's inclination towards suspicion and paranoia was heightened in 1564 when his friend and valued military commander, Prince Andrei Kurbsky, defected to the Lithuanians during the contest for power in the Baltic. This pushed Yvonne down a devastating path. Just before the Feast of St. Nicholas in 1564, Yvonne left Moscow for his nearby estate, accompanied by his second wife, two surviving sons, and close advisors. He ordered many boyars to accompany him too, along with their wives and families. It seemed odd that Ivan also brought precious icons, the royal regalia, and many other treasures from the Kremlin. But his subjects discovered the full import of this move in January 1565. As the winter holidays were coming to a close, two letters arrived back in Moscow. They were addressed to the new metropolitan, and the common people of the capital. In these missives, Ivan complained of treason and treachery among church officials and the boyars alike. He railed against church interference in his attempts to exercise justice and punish suspected traitors. He also accused the boyars of conspiring with foreign enemies and domestic rivals and of stealing his treasure. Ivan assured the common people he knew they were innocent in these matters. But given the corruption and treachery of the boyars, he felt bound to abandon his realm with heartfelt grief. The Tsar was abdicating. The people begged Ivan to return. They feared that the boyars would bring ruin. They implored him, how can a sheep live without a shepherd? How can we live without a lord? Ivan clearly had made the people his allies against the elite. The people's reaction demonstrates a tendency among Russian peasants and townsmen right up to the 20th century to believe in the Tsar's fairness and goodness. A Russian proverb from the time sums up the popular belief. God is in his heavens and the Tsar is far away. In other words, exploitation and hardship was the work of the boyars, not of God's divinely ordained ruler. In agreeing to return to Moscow, Ivan demanded the authority to punish and execute suspected traitors and all those who disobeyed him. He then announced that henceforth, his kingdom would be divided into two. One part would be the Tsar's personal appanage or property, which he called the Oprichnina. Few understood what this would mean in early 1565. Oprichnina was an archaic word that referenced land retained by a widow, and it seemed to have little significance for the Tsar but its deadly meaning soon became apparent. The boyars who had lived in these territories were now executed, or if they were lucky, expelled from their lands. Ivan then brought in lower ranking members of the gentry, whose loyalties clearly lay with the Tsar, to populate the lands. This was a way for Ivan to demonstrate his power, reward men who proved their loyalty, and to punish anyone whom he deemed disloyal or a threat. The remainder of the, of the realm was deemed the Zemshina, a deriv derivative of the word land. Ivan declared that it was to be ruled by the boyars as before. Ivan took a hands-off approach here. He showed interest in Zemshina affairs only when they seemed to boil over into the lands of the Oprichnina. Within the Oprichnina, Ivan's vengeance came quickly. He organized a cadre of bodyguards called the Oprichniki, who operated with impunity. They dressed in black, with a dog's head and broom attached to the sides of their black horses. The Oprichniki would first bark and bite the enemies of the Tsar, and then sweep them out of the country. Old scores were settled, and threats, both potential and imagined, eradicated. Tens of thousands of Russians are believed to have died during the Oprichnina. Ivan himself took a direct role in some of the killings. After forcing one foe to don royal robes and sit on his throne, Ivan stabbed him several times through the heart. His body was dragged through the city and his servants drowned. Even the Metropolitan Philip was not safe. After Philip publicly upbraided Ivan, he was defrocked, imprisoned in a monastery, and then suffocated in his cell. 
Ivan, in an effort to expand Russian territory further into the Baltic region, was also at war with the Livonian Order of Knights and the forces of the combined Polish-Lithuanian state. Although Christian, these opponents weren't Orthodox. So many Russians saw the battles as being for faith as well as territory, as they had in earlier actions against the Muslim Khanates. By 1569, neither war was going well. The prospect of failing against the so-called infidels seemed a betrayal of Russia's holy mission. And since neither Ivan nor the mission could be questioned, he became convinced that treason must be to blame. The violence of his purge was about to widen. Now, Ivan's wrath fell on the towns of Tver and Novgorod. Convinced that the cities were rife with treacherous plots against him, he undertook mass executions. People were brutally cut down, and living and the dead alike were pushed under river ice. The initial violence was followed by widespread disease and famine that killed thousands more. Ivan's sadism reached a crescendo in the summer of 1570. On one day that July, Ivan and his executioners killed 116 victims in a variety of horrific ways. Some were impaled, some burned alive, some beheaded, others were hacked to pieces. Then, just as suddenly, the terror ended. Ivan terminated the Oprichnina in 1572, and he forbade discussion of its existence afterwards. Like so many other aspects of Ivan's reign, the motives behind his decision lie muddled in history. Most likely, he believed his rivals had been van vanquished. Still, Ivan did not curb his violent ways. In 1581, he committed a murder that would have long-lasting consequences. The Tsar quarreled with his oldest son, Ivan Ivanovich, after rebuking his pregnant daughter-in-law over a superficial matter. In a fit of rage, Ivan hit his son with a metal staff and killed the heir to the throne. The event is poignantly depicted in a painting by Ilya Repin, a 19th century Russian master of realism. The horror and seeming madness of the Russian Tsar is on full display. Ivan is portrayed as a shattered spirit, not the omnipotent autocrat, but instead a broken, aging man consumed by demons. Until his own death in 1584, Ivan the Terrible became increasingly tyrannical and erratic. Yet Repin's portrait doesn't conform to popular folklore and songs in which Ivan IV is remembered as a strong, decisive, and just ruler. How can Ivan be both terrible and awesome? Part of the reason lies in the translation. In Russian, Ivan IV is known as Ivan Grozny. While the Russian term Grozny can mean terrible, a better translation is fearsome, threatening, or even awesome. Ivan's unrivaled power and willingness to use violence was indeed something to be feared, but the exercise of that power especially when a judge to be used for positive purposes, was awe-inspiring. Russia fell into a period of civil war and foreign invasion within a generation of his passing. Known as the Time of Troubles, suffering and death far outpaced what had been experienced during Ivan's reign. Consequently, Russians longing grew for the stabilizing force and security rendered by a strong legitimate ruler even one who wasn't afraid to use violence. In time, Ivan the Fourth's reign became romanticized. In popular culture, he earned a reputation as a friend of the common people and an enemy of the boyars. In the decade before World War II, the Soviet dictator Joseph Stalin took inspiration from Ivan in his quest to vanquish the traitors whom he believed threatened his realm. Stalin commissioned artistic works to celebrate Ivan as a source of patriotic inspiration and historical sanction for his own rule. The most significant example is Sergei Eisenstein's epic 1944 film, Ivan the Terrible. Filmed in the midst of the Second World War, Eisenstein's depiction of Ivan unifying Russia 
and defending the country from enemies foreign and domestic was poignantly received. It is Ivan's reputation as a reformer, a conqueror, a founder of the Russian state that is celebrated in the Tsar's statue in Uryol. Ivan's bronze likeness depicts him atop a horse, clad in royal robes with a variation of the cap of Monomach on his head. In one hand, he holds the Orthodox cross. In the other, an unsheathed sword. The madness displayed in Repin's portrait is nowhere to be found. Ivan is celebrated as a warrior czar, defending his country and the faith in this very modern statue. Today, the fact that Russians wax nostalgically for Ivan well into the 21st century speaks to the complicated and powerful legacy of the 16th century ruler and to the enduring roots of their cultural norms.